secondary forest growing on land that was once logged or used for cattle pasture. In the past, most degraded land was left to regenerate on its own or was planted with non-native teak, pine, or eucalyptus. But as human populations skyrocket, tropical forest becomes ever more important. At the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, scientists and students from around the world are learning from nature how to create a more sustainable future. Our Agua Salud experiment shows us how smart reforestation can protect water supplies, mitigate climate change, and protect biodiversity. In the largest tropical reforestation experiment of its kind, we planted 150,000 trees and protected degraded lands in a three square mile area in the Panama Canal watershed. The trees are growing remarkably quickly, demonstrating nature's own resilience in the face of climate change. On poor soils, we've planted native hardwood species that grow larger and store more carbon than non-native teak, helping mitigate climate change and also providing a better investment option for rural landowners. To better understand how land use management affects water supplies, we compared the amount of water in streams draining cattle pasture with the amount of water in streams draining forested land. Water flows quickly over the packed soils of cattle pastures. And we've confirmed that forest soils act as a sponge. Water percolates down into holes made by animals and plant roots and is stored in the soil, reducing flooding during major storms and providing water during dry periods. We're learning from nature that if we grow new forest on degraded lands, the trees attract birds and mammals that help to spread seeds and pollinate flowers, bringing new life to once barren landscapes. This research pioneered in Panama is leading to smarter land use planning that will keep people safe around the world. Sorry guys, technical difficulties. No worries. Okay, well, I think everybody should be on now. It should give given people enough time to log on. So in celebration of World Rainforest Day, Earth Optimism has gathered experts from the field to share stories of what's working in rainforest conservation. And before we kick things off, I'm just gonna quickly run through how this will work so whether you're tuned in here on Zoom or you're on our Facebook live stream, you can type questions for our speakers at any time in the comments. Our first speaker, Tom Lovejoy, will have a brief Q&A immediately following his talk. And then we will have an open Q&A with the rest of our speakers at the very end. So to get us started, we welcome the chair of the Global Earth Optimism Advisory Committee, the leader in rainforest conservation, Tom Lovejoy. Well, thank you very much <clears throat> for Smithsonian Earth Optimism for celebrating this incredibly important day, Rainforest Day. And the right way to think about rainforests is actually the greatest expression of life on Earth. Uh, an extraordinary amount of the biological diversity of the planet uh, exists in these amazing forests. Although when you first go in them, you wonder what the big deal is. You don't really see a lot. Um, and it's only when your ears and eyes become accustomed that you begin to pick up how overflowing with life they really are. And I mean, to give an interesting example, I was maybe three or four years ago, I was taking a bunch of people to my camp in the middle of the Amazon uh, where we do the forest fragmentation studies. But this camp is in the intact forest for comparison. And I always like to get to the camp before everybody else so I can welcome them. And I'm, so I'm barreling down the trail and all of a sudden I see something 
flying out of the corner of my eye. Uh, and I think, oh, it's a Morpha butterfly. Uh, but I take a few more steps and then I realize that wasn't flying like a Morpho butterfly. It was much floppier. And I take a closer look and it's, and it's pale, very pale, almost white. So I followed it and eventually it landed on a tree trunk. And it turned out to be this extraordinarily rare moth known as the white witch, uh, which is so rare that nobody's ever seen its caterpillar. Um, and that's why biologists like me love the rainforest, because as I like to say, it's like a Christmas stocking for a biologist for which there is no end. Uh, these forests have also been home to indigenous peoples, you know, for millennia. Uh, they know a lot about these forests. And sometimes that knowledge spills over into useful things, uh, like curare that comes out of the Amazon and the new, new world tropical forests and provides muscle relaxant and major abdominal surgery wherever it's done in the world. Uh, but the rainforest is also going fast. Uh, I'm not sure I can give you the percentage of the rainforest that has gone in my lifetime, but it's at least about half of it. The Amazon was 97% intact when I first arrived and it's now at least 20% deforested. Um, and a lot of what's driving that is not very sensible projects of infrastructure and development, uh, right, which are very sort of short-sighted because the real treasure here is the biology. And as I like to say, it's like a gigantic living library for the life sciences. Uh, with each species representing a set of solutions to a particular set of biological challenges, any one of which can be transformational uh, to the life sciences. Uh, and in an in a interesting kind of way, I mean, most societies have deep respect for libraries. Uh, why shouldn't they have a respect for the living library uh, for life on earth. Not that it's just rainforest, but rainforests have more books in that library uh, than any other kind of habitat. So it also turns out uh, that not all rainforests are the same. Not all parts of the Amazon are the same. Uh, families of fruit loving birds are absent from the Congo forest, for example. Um, the dominant trees of most of the Southeast Asian forests are in a single family. Um, and they're all filled with just amazing plants and animals. Um, only a portion of which have actually been described by science. Uh, and that's why so many biologists just gravitate for the rainforest, like the people you will be hearing from in the panel that follows. Um, so I, I hope this is a moment of truth for humanity, this uh, pandemic, which really is the consequence of the invasion and destruction of nature and inappropriate wildlife trade and inappropriate wildlife markets. Uh, all the natural habitats of the world have, have normally, they just have pathogens which are part of their ecology. And the way to reduce the probability of 
any one of those spilling over and creating the kind of problems we're all coping with at the moment is to really change how we uh, approach the natural world. <clears throat> Stop driving infrastructure projects uh, into the remaining wild places on the planet uh, and control the, the, uh, the wildlife trade and the wildlife markets. Uh, so if ever there was a lesson to humanity that we need to respect nature, <coughs> that's, that's the lesson of the pandemic. And back when I was a graduate student, if anybody can remember that long ago, uh, I was banding birds down near the mouth of the Amazon. And that's what my PhD thesis ended up being about. But I was also studying the antibodies of arthropod-borne viruses those birds were carrying. So I basically minored in epidemiology and public health. Uh, which makes me understand how pathogens are just normally part of, of natural systems and how our behavior can increase the probability of them becoming problems in terms of human disease or not. It's all how we behave. And rather than go on forever, I will just end by telling you a, a, a really interesting story. So this is back in the, in the late 60s and I'm doing my PhD in the Amazon and I'm based at a research institute near the mouth of the Amazon named the Instituto Evandro Chagas. And I was sh sharing an office with a wild charismatic, brilliant Colombian research MD, MD named Jorge Bochel, who previously had been the director, not immediately, but had previously been the second director of the famous laboratory at Villa Vicencio in Colombia. And at that point, the battle to control yellow fever uh, was still a big battle led by the Rockefeller Foundation. And eventually there was a vaccine, the best vaccine ever made, it's good for life, uh, came out of that. Uh, but they also understood you could control the urban cycles by just removing breeding places for mosquitoes. Uh, but there was another cycle that rambled through the canopy of the forest, uh, would affect howler monkeys and other monkeys. Uh, it would then drop dead to the rainforest floor and the nomadic virus would move on, right? Uh, and yet occasionally somebody would walk out of that forest with a, with a case of jungle yellow fever. And it was Jorge who discovered the secret by being sort of a, an intelligent observer watching some woodcutters bring down some trees. And suddenly they were surrounded by little blue mosquitoes, canopy mosquitoes of the genus Hemagogus. So it's sort of the ultimate metaphor for disturbing the environment with uh, unfortunate consequences for people. Uh, and as we think about all the ecosystems of the planet and all the biodiversity in those ecosystems, we're really blowing ripples of change through all of them by direct impact and but especially from looking ahead, climate change. And that's gonna tip the balance in favor of pandemics being more likely. So I think on this Rainforest Day, we should be celebrating not only the greatest expression of life on earth, but hopefully a turning point in how we respect the rainforest, the planet, and the rest of the natural habitats and species that we have the great fortune to share the planet with. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Well, thank you so much, Tom. Um, I guess we'll wait just a couple of minutes to see if we get any questions in. Andrea is going to send them my way. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and I do have a question. Do you have one particular moment in the rainforest in particular that made you see hope in rainforest conservation, gave you a sense that there is optimism in saving the rainforest? Well, you know, I think in an interesting kind of way, this will surprise you. Um, it's when I was in Rio de Janeiro and suddenly realized that the Tijuca forest was actually a tropical forest restoration project created by the then emperor of Brazil to restore the watershed of Rio. And it is the largest urban forest in the world. So it carries that same sort of sense of hope as the reforestation project being described in the film we just saw. Yeah, great. I think we have time for just one more. Andrew, do we have any more? I'm on mute. Um, not that I see. If anybody has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but Tom, I have a question. I know that you've been going down to um, the Amazon frequently. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what are, what are some of the things that you're working on and how can we, um, I guess, what can we look forward to as next steps? So at the moment, everything is shut down in the, in the research area um, and at the National Institute for Amazon Research and similar institutions and universities because they have a, a pandemic situation, which actually is even worse than the United States. Um, so we've just had to do that to keep everybody safe and everybody is safe, which I'm very excited about. Um, but I think we're, we're looking forward to a really interesting renaissance when everybody comes to emerge from all of that. Uh, thinking of new questions, uh, new ways to protect. And I didn't go into it at great length and I should have touched on it, so I will now. Uh, one of the amazing things about the Amazon is that it makes half of its own rainfall. Uh, and that's because the air masses move at the equator uh, from east to west. And after it rains, the, the moisture evaporates off the complex surface of the forest and also transpire through the leaves. I mean, leaves play a huge role here. And so the Amazon forest basically recycles that moisture five or six times as it moves from the Atlantic to the Andes. Uh, and only recently have we begun to worry how much deforestation could actually cause that to degrade so that one doesn't have enough rain to actually have a rainforest. And the, the most vulnerable area to that is in the south and east of the Amazon, which were relatively low rainfall uh, compared to the rest of the Amazon. Uh, and we're actually seeing indications that we're right at a tipping point uh, where there could be insufficient rain to keep that in forest. The good news is, uh, is reforestation, restoration like we were talking about earlier can build back that margin of safety and it's important for the Amazon. It's also important for every country in South America, except for Chile, because they all get important moisture from that hydrological cycle. So it's really connected to a continental climate system in that, ex in that instance. Looks like we did get a few more questions in, Andrea. Do you think we have time to go ahead and take those? Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Um, this one, does Professor Lovejoy think that the half earth for nature strategy for protecting nature is an important and or effective one? Or would he recommend other approaches to global conservation? 
So my, my sense of all of this is, to begin with, half Earth is really important because it changes the context of the discussion about what is conservation and how much nature is actually enough. Um, and the details of it will be complex according to where one is actually trying to make it come to pass. It won't all be possible to be national parks and things like that. Um, but it, it basically sets a different framework for thinking about conservation going forward. So within that, there are really important initiatives like 30% of the planet in protected areas by 3030, um, the Global Deal for Nature, which is looking at not only the biodiversity, but also the functioning of the ecosystems and major efforts at restoration, which could pull some of that CO2 back from the atmosphere uh, and enable us to have much less of an impact from climate change than we're currently slated for. Um, so basically, I think it's not only a moment of truth because of the pandemic, uh, it should open our eyes to managing this planet as the linked biological and physical system that it is, uh, and actually come to embrace nature as part of a really beneficial and sustainable future. Great. We're going to take one more. Um, looks like there were a couple questions added, but just for time, we'll take one more question for Professor Lovejoy. And I think I'll save the rest for the full panel to answer at the end. I want to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, stay, stay, on the, stay on the Zoom. <laughs> I will. What? So here's the last one for you, and then we'll move along for time's sake. What should the role of governments be to protect the rainforest? So I, I think you cannot achieve what needs to be achieved without a strong involvement of government. But it also is not going to work if it's just top down. Uh, we need to think a lot about the people who live in these regions and how we can help them gain a better trajectory than they have at the moment, uh, better quality of life, and even quality of life in rainforest cities. Uh, that hasn't gotten anywhere near as much as the attention as it, I think, deserves. So it's got to be a joint exercise between the NGO world, the private sector, uh, thinking about sustainable infrastructure, for example, and governments, not just at national levels, but also at uh, provincial and state levels. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Tom. Um, I think that we're going to go ahead and start to transition into the rest of the panel. Um, and then as Kat mentioned, we'll be taking questions. So we're going to go through all of our panelists and then we'll have questions at the very end. Um, and so if you do have questions, please do send them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen um, or in the chat. Um, okay, so without any <laughs> um, delay, I'd like to go to Niyanta Spellman, the CEO of Rainforest Partnerships. Niyanta, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna unmute you, there we go. Um, and then really quick, sorry, I'm gonna try this spotlight video to see if that helps. So that everyone. Okay. Great. So hello everybody. Um, uh, and thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Professor Lovejoy. What a wonderful way to get started. And happy World Rainforest Day, everybody. <laughs> uh, you cannot imagine my joy at 
the, the fact that we're all celebrating these forests today, that um, it's not just all of us here on the panel today. It is not just um, uh, the few people we know in the NGO world and a few governments and individuals that have been working on rainforest protection, but overnight, there were over 300 organizations, most of them I'd never heard of, that were actually uh, sharing on social media what they were doing for World Rainforest Day. And so um, it's a lot of joy to feel and to share with all of you. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about why World Rainforest Day and a little bit about how it's grounded and where it came from. Um, so uh, Professor Lovejoy already talked about why forests, these forests are so important, and, and the very fact that we're losing them uh, at unprecedented rates. You know, there are those who said, didn't we save them all in the 70s and 80s? And you know, that's further from the truth. Um, uh, here's the stat I use. I'm 55 years old, and almost in my lifetime, we've lost about half of them. And for uh, an ecosystem that's less than, that covers less than 3% of our land mass on our planet, that's pretty incredible. And when you talk about what, again, Professor Lovejoy talked about in terms of um, uh, what the threats are, you know, the dieback scenario when we lose enough of the Amazon that it may not be able to make its own rain. The Amazon fires, the news of the fires last year awakened a lot of people. All that is a backdrop. But if we just focus on all that, then we get nowhere because most people are gonna just shut down. Um, fear might get immediate attention and any of us in this world, in this space, we did not get much rest when the news hit uh, mainstream media about what the Amazon fires were doing last year. Um, we knew about it, but the world was just sort of waking up to it, right? And yet that was immediate attention. And you know, two months later, three months later, people just went on. And part of it is that there hasn't been the sort of hope or this optimistic view. And so what I think about us as Rainforest Partnership is, you know, it's sort of we think of ourselves as the purveyor of hope. Our work is very much grounded in doing the sort of very real, unwieldy, intense work of protecting tropical rainforests, working directly with communities, and then every level of government. And any of you on this call uh, that does the work, you know how unwieldy it is. And you know, most people cannot fathom what that's like, right? Um, we have to make it look easy because we've gone to a world in a space where everybody wants a bite-sized explanation. People don't want complexity. But rainforests are complex. And by their nature, the solutions they demand are complex. And so we cannot do that quite in the same way. We cannot really do the doom and gloom. And so what do we do? Um, so when we began as Rainforest Partnership, um, we, our work is about working directly with rainforest communities and work, we work in the tropical Andes, we work in the Amazon, we work in Pacific rainforest. That informs much of what we understand and how we relate to people all around us. But we also knew that there was another side of the equation, and that is the rest of the world. How do we, how do we activate the rest of the world? How do we um, make people aware for why these forests are important? They're magical, they're beautiful, they're amazing. But most people don't know about them, right? For why they're really important, or how they're important, and how they're vital to the very balance um, that we need in terms of a planet that thrives and supports our humankind and everything else that coexists with us on this planet, right? And so early on, we started Films for the Forest, an international short film challenge in 2010. Then we did Rainforest Listening, a very innovative um, uh, geotag rainforest sounds that we planted in different places in New York and Paris during the, uh, the COP, uh, which, Anybody who doesn't know the UNFCCC's climate change uh, um, conferences, the UN's climate conferences that brought us about the Paris Agreement and all the rest of it. But here's the thing. We did those things. And back, back in 2014, somebody in our office says, do we have a World Rainforest Day? It's like, why isn't there one? Shouldn't there be one? And we thought, okay. So we grabbed the URL 
And by next year, um, during Climate Week, we picked June 22nd as the date. And that was 2015. As I wouldn't go back into what happened. Much happened. Uh, we got, you know, things set quite nicely for um, enough actions to happen in Lima that was enough of a foundation to get us the Paris Agreement in Paris the year after. But here's what we did. We said, okay, we're going to launch it. Well, it didn't quite happen. didn't quite happen. And then there was um, a president for uh, the country that many of us belong to decided that he's going to pull us out of the Paris Agreement. And we decided there wasn't time to wait. And so in 2017, um, we launched World Rainforest Day. In Lima, there were quite a few folks uh, during the COP20 that had actually agreed to be partners. Um, and in 2017, we pulled 29 of them together to launch World Rainforest Day. And we had actions on all six continents, pretty amazing. Um, first time we had an audience on a Facebook Live session in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as somebody who was born in Tanzania and who grew up in Tanzania, that was just amazing for me. Um, um, and we did that. And so it ha happened for the next three years. We had partners, a lot happened. And here's what happened this year. I think the pandemic has woken people up in a very different way. We've all gone digital because we've had to go digital. And so what had to be a digital event, a global digital event, even as most of us did things, uh, activations and um, 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 all sorts of uh, um, different events. This year, it had to be a, a digital event. And what's incredible about it is that we have, I don't know how many partners, maybe there are over 100 partners um, for World Rainforest Day. There, is, there are actions being taken all over the globe by so many folks. People are waking up, people are wanting to do something. And here's the thing. So first of all, I know I don't have much time. I'm about to run out of time. There is a live stream we're doing every six hours. I, I forget how many times we're doing it in that 20, uh, 48 hour period. So the international dateline to international dateline that is World Rainforest Day um, that you can watch. And it has content from 15 partners around the world. You can actually watch World Rainforest Day uh, related actions from all these partners. You can take actions and make your commitments and share with the hashtag World Rainforest Day. It can be something small, it can be really large. Here's what couple of things we're doing as Rainforest Partnership. We're actually launching today a, a Gen Z for the Trees initiative. These are our young folks in our off office who are starting it. My pet name for them is the Z's for the Trees. What's incredible about it, think about the young ones. Heard a, stat, a statistic that by 2026, they're going to be 40% of the, popul um, the um, consumer population. And the idea is, this is something they said, that how do we bring them uh, together and remind them about the truth that they have a lot of power to compel our governments, to compel our corporations, to compel our um, fellow NGOs and themselves to actually really take action and change the trajectory that we're currently supposedly on, but how do we chart a different trajectory to 2025, to 2030, and for our planet, that we do protect these forests and thereby protect our planet and all of us with it. And so um, I would invite everybody to go to worldrainforestday.org and um, check out what's happening there. Watch for the kind of pledges people are making. I just heard about dozens of reta uh, retailers um, that are um, committing to deforestation-free fashion supply chains. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening like that. So thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you for uh, creating this panel in the first place and, and talking about hope, because that's what it's going to take. Thank you. Thank you so much, Niyanta. That was wonderful. Um, and we are so happy to be part of World Rainforest Day here at Smithsonian. Um, and it's great to be able to have you and Tom kicking this session off. Um, 
Next, we'd like to go to the, uh, the Bolivian Amazon, and we have Tijali Borisma here with us from Asociación Armonia. Um, and I am going to let him start to share his screen. Um, okay. Uh, well, there's stuff. Do you want to continue? No, sorry. I'm still I'm still working on technical difficulties. Um, is that showing yet? Can you see my screen? I can see yes. yours. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for the introduction and welcome everybody to uh, to this webinar. And of course, first of all, uh, happy Rainforest Day. Um, like has been said before, there's a lot of doom around conservation right now, but today I would really like to bring a positive story. I would like to talk about the comeback of the world's rarest macaw, the Bolivian endemic blue-throated macaw. So I'm Chola Borsma, Conservation Program Director for Asociación Armonía. And uh, our main, well, we're the leading bird conservation NGO of Bolivia, and our main goal is to protect habitat for the most threatened bird species. And we do that through uh, private reserve creation, uh, environmental education, empowering those local communities and key stakeholders, and of course, scientific research. And four of our most important species we're working on right now is the endemic red fronted macaw and, and horned curacao, the near endemic royal synclodus of the, of the high Andes, and today's topic, the blue throated macaw. So Armonia has been now working for over two decades, preventing the extinction of, of this species. And for that, I'd like to bring you to the heart of South America. Uh, Bolivia, and as you can see, the northern section of Bolivia is, is within the Amazon basin, and which we kind of like know of, of the rainforest area. But I'll be talking today about a very specific habitat within that Amazon basin, and I'll explain more about that later on. Uh, so in the north, we're bordered by Peru and Brazil, and in the south, by Paraguay, Argentina, and Chile. And if we're looking at that vast uh, uh, rainforest habitat, there is this little teeny tiny section in the south that is actually the natural uh, grasslands of northern Bolivia. And that is where this endemic mod occurs in three isolated subpopulations. So we're estimating that the population is between 312 and, and 455 individuals left in the wild. And it has mainly been the, the illegal pet trade of the 70s and 80s that caused this, this population really to plummet. And only in 92, we rediscovered the blue-throated macaw, and, and mainly due to uh, national and international law and legislation, the illegal pet trade has been, has been mainly stopped. But there's also a lot of local threats. And in this case, the use of the tail feathers of macaws for natural headdresses in, in, in tradi traditional dances. And for, to, to make a headdress like this, you kind of had to kill 15 macaws and, uh, to, make, to make a headdress like this. So one of the projects of Armonia, what we've been trying to do to prevent the extinction, to prevent the killing of macaws, is to change feathers to an, an alternative product. Now the feathers are made out of fabric and 90% of all the headdresses used in traditional dances right now is made out of these, these artificial feathers. But the main threat is unsustainable uh, uh, land use. And to be honest, in, in the case of natural savanna habitat in that Amazon basin, cattle might not even be the worst enemy. Uh, if we're looking at agriculture that comes in, converting these natural landscapes to, to soya fields and rice fields, actually, if cattle ranching is done in a sustainable way, it could actually keep and maintain a lot of biodiversity. But presently, it's been done in a very unsustainable way. In order to have cattle uh, enough uh, forage, uh, these natural grasslands are, are being burned annually in order to have that nutrient-rich grass growing up for, for cows. So Armonia 
created a 27,000 acre Parvasul nature reserve to actually protect key habitat for this critically endangered species. And well, we're talking about rainforests, we're talking about uh, uh, ecosystems with a lot of trees, but actually within the Amazon basin, you got different, a whole lot of different ecosystems. And here in this case, you should really visualize yourself in this vast open savanna habitat eight months out of the year completely flooded and trees can only grow on elevated areas like here as you can see these small pre-columbian man-made forest islands are areas where, where trees can grow but also rainforests you can you can find them along uh, river systems where river sediment has been deposited and trees can grow and these two landscape elements are key for the blue throat of macaws those small forest islands are used as safe havens for roosting for those macaws. And uh, the, the gallery forest habitat is the main foraging habitat for the species, where it eats the fruits of the motaku palm, their main, main uh, uh, food source. Now, in order to protect that large reserve and in order to prevent those man-made fires that come in from, from neighboring ranches where they annually burn uh, their grasslands, we, had, we literally had to purchase a, a tractor with all its implements and starting to build fire breaks to protect habitat for threatened species. But in this case, fire is also part of the ecosystem. So we're trying to manage these grasslands uh, through fires. But here in this case, we're actually improving our fire break system. So you got these clean fire breaks and now we're building a section parallel to it of 50 meters that is completely burned. So if a fire comes in from a neighboring ranch, it hits that recently burned grassland, it really goes down in intensity and dies off on these, on these uh, clean fire breaks. But we're also focusing on habitat restoration. And in this case, uh, those small forest islands that are key for roosting habitat for the macaws. And as you can see here, there's no regeneration whatsoever. Cows are foraging in those, those flooded grasslands. At night, they're using these small forest islands as refuge to sleep and to dry their hooves, but they're eating away all the regeneration of trees. So one of the projects that have, we have been uh, implementing within that uh, savanna grassland system is fencing off these forest islands, preventing cattle from, from entering and uh, start planting motaku trees to start reforesting these, these forest islands. And by, by focusing on blue throat of macaw conservation, only a single species, we're of course protecting habitat for many other species like this giant anteater, the elusive and amazing uh, maned wolf, but also uh, a grassland species, threatened grassland species like this cocktail tyrant, but also critical stopover habitat for North American uh, migratory shorebirds that migrate all the way from the Arctics down to uh, uh, Northern Argentina. And to really push the increase of, of the population, Armonia has established a, a nest box project in, in 2005, and that has now um, resulted in 90, uh, successfully fledged chicks, really increasing that small population of, of macaws. And if you're keen on, on actually seeing those, those conservation actions uh, firsthand, you're more than welcome to, to come and visit Barbasul Nature Reserve. We got uh, uh, cabins to come over and actually see that amazing habitat for yourself and, and see the, the efforts conservation institutions uh, put in place to save, uh, to save habitat. And of course, this work has been made possible by, by many donors, by many supporters that have been uh, supporting Armonia for, for over two decades, which we are extremely grateful to. Thank you so much for your attention and please help us uh, prevent species extinction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jolly. And I've actually been watching, um, following you guys on Facebook for a while now. And 
Um, remember when you were posting during the fires in the Amazon about the improved fire breaks, and I thought that that would be such a great example um, for us to be able to share through Earth Optimism because we really are looking at how do you share those things that are working um, so that others can look at replication. Um, exactly. Thank you so much. We're really so happy that you could be here today. Um, My pleasure. Thanks. So now we're going to go to Stuart Dayton with the Trillion Trees. He is the head of Trillion Trees and he also um, represents World Wildlife Fund UK. Um, so Sorry, Stuart, give me one second. I need to make you a co-host, spotlight your video, um, and then when you share your screen. Okay, super. Can everybody see that? We're good to go? Okay, yep, I think we're good to Great. go. Yeah. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you very much indeed. And I'm Stuart Dayton. I head up Trillion Trees with uh, WWF, and really delighted to be able to talk to you on World Rainforest Day, um, to really highlight the wonder of trees and uh, to sort of explain a little bit about the benefits of, of trees for us, but importantly also to highlight a couple of case studies that hopefully might inspire some further action that we're undertaking to really try to encourage others to um, think about restoration activity on, um, on a day of optimism. So I suppose the first and biggest um, aspect of the trees and the real wonder of them is just their real importance as a nature-based solution in fact climate uh, stability. Over 30 percent of the climate that's in the, uh, the carbon that's in the atmosphere we can uh, sequester that and utilize uh, trees really effectively in tackling the climate problem and we've heard about how the the Amazon is such a critical, as critical aspect of that but importantly our sort of rainforest drive inland water systems and that's so important for many people's livelihoods um, and well-being. Perhaps one of the wonders of trees that's perhaps more well-known is just their homes for nature and the sheer biodiversity that thrives within them. Over 80% of the world's forest bi uh, biodiversity is in the world's forests that we know about and over 40% of that is in rainforests. And in rainforests um, across the globe there is such wonder and beauty. There's real mystery in our rainforests. Our trees communicate with each other. They pass nutrients to each other through, their, through fungi and their root systems. But also, uh, forests are so important to us for our own well being. Spending time in forests can be really beneficial to us. Trees and plants release phytocides, and those phytocides can help our immune system. But there is also real beauty in our trees in the patterns, the shapes, their longevity. And I think we really want to be able to tell these stories for our future generations, because it's the importance of our forest for people that is so critical. And in Trillion Trees, we look at how we can address these issues of how can we look at ending deforestation? And we know that's such a critical problem at the moment, but we also look towards um, advancing restoration and also the protection of trees. Through these sort of three, three approaches, we look at how can we deliver um, and, and initiate local initiatives that really pick up to be able to deliver some landscape ventures that will work across regional scales. Um, and we try to pull all this together through a network of issues and, and projects that we pull together to try to find the right way to address the right trees in the right places through a whole range of projects, looking at ending deforestation, improving protection and advancing restoration. We're currently working in 19 countries across the globe and we're looking to expand beyond that. As you can see from the map, predominantly it's in the tropical areas, tropical forest, rainforest forest areas. And that's where we believe we can really have the biggest impact. And I'm gonna just highlight a couple of case studies that we have within Trillion Trees to really show how restoration activity can really help. And I'm gonna use one in Tanzania and one in Rwanda. And this first one, um, I'm going to explain about the coastal forests in Pugu, Kazumbui, and Bukundu, which are just on the edge of Dar es Salaam, which is a major city in Tanzania. Now, the Tanzanian government has actually said that they would commit to restoring 5.2 million hectares of, of forest. And we're looking to uh, pull together the small remnants of the coastal forest so that we are restoring and protecting 
collecting those remaining fragments around the Tanzanian coastal forest. Because these are really important for endemic species. Over 30% of the species in these forests are endemic. And they provide real opportunities for local people. And also we're trying to look at restoration that will help the city dwellers really around Dar es Salaam. And this work really highlights the importance of how the proximity to a major city can help a tropical forest, this is a tropical moist forest, really in the restoration activity that provides benefits through restoration and education. And we're doing that with local people and communities. And in partnership with the Tanzanian Forest Service, the local communities are getting out, engaging in planting trees. They're finding economic value through tourism, ecotourism, but also finding products in the forest through using uh, the forest to create, in this case, honey. And it really is quite encouraging projects that we're finding that people are actually delivering economic value for people around uh, Dar es Salaam. Crucially, this is about education as well, and it's engaging the local community and restoring the forest and gaining the benefits from the forest for water purification and for local climate and understanding that and the benefits for local people. And it's getting the children and communities out planting those trees. The second example I'm going to explain is in Yuungi National Park in Rwanda. This is one of the most important rainforests in the Rift Valley and Highlands in Rwanda. It has 13 primate species and countless of other wildlife flora and fauna. The park is in real need of restoration. Um, and actually in this area, unfortunately because of past conflicts and also because of uh, just people trying to find economic value in the forest through um, using, uh, trying to smoke out wild, uh, beet, wild honey, it has caused fires in the area. And that's really caused a, a mass de uh, degradation that requires restoration in the, in, in the forest. And we've looked to try to use natural regeneration as a means to do that, because with the fires, ferns have established, and those ferns are suppressing the natural regeneration of the forest. And yet this is such a critical area driving, an in, uh, driving water cycles, because the, this area helps with the, the, the water systems in the valleys below, but also that water helps with deriving the country's power hydro system. It's over half of the electricity is delivered in the country through hydroelectricity. So the solution here was to really work with the local community again, get them to get out in the, uh, and start to help clearing the, the ferns and understanding the benefit that that would have. But importantly, we had to look at economic value as well. And so a local loan scheme was set up with a savings uh, area to set a cooperative that allowed people to come together to create honey that also helped preserve the livelihood. So there wasn't the need for the wild honey. And actually being able to do this has helped immensely. And you can see here through clearing the ferns, it allows the natural regeneration of the forest to come back, opening up to the natural seed bank that's in the soils to come to the fore and also from the trees around. Importantly, I said about having the right trees in the right places. The first thing is to keep this, the, the trees standing. And we've got to be able to forest, uh, follow the landscape restoration principles, whether it be for one tree or for a million trees. And it's so important to engage local stakeholders. We've tried to prioritize natural regeneration where possible and use native species, but sometimes we recognize that non-native species may be appropriate for socioeconomic reasons, maybe with fruit trees or something like that. And plantations should never replace ecosystems like um, uh, peatlands or wetlands. But we really hope that um, the work that we're doing can inspire others, particularly to help ensure that we can protect and restore our rainforests around the globe. And if you'd like to hear more about our work or see more about that's happening, find out about us on uh, our website, brilliantrees.org. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stuart. That was wonderful. Um, and it's great to see this project in so many different parts of the world. Um, we're now going to move on to Rainy Cortez from TNC. Let me just, there we go. 
Great. Thank you so much um, for organizing this event. It's very exciting to be celebrating rainforest today. Um, I'm Rainy Cortez. I'm the conservation director of our global program on conservation and partnership with indigenous peoples and local communities at the Nature Conservancy. And so I'm going to be talking about our work to protect uh, tropical forests as well as other habitat in partnership with indigenous people around the world. Um, so just to highlight to start out with that indigenous people and local communities are some of the most important partners that we can have um, in, our, in our quest to protect and conserve uh, tropical forests. Um, indigenous people and local communities own or manage up to 25% of global land area, 17% um, of global forest carbon, and the majority of biodiversity that remains on our planet. And so we cannot achieve our goals in rainforest protection without um, really partnering with those local communities. In addition, a lot of indigenous people and local communities have this deep wisdom about how to live um, in harmony with the, the forest. They know about the intersections between people and nature. We're not separate. We're all one and they have this ecological wisdom that goes back millennia about how to successfully steward um, those natural resources. And that's something that we as conservation organizations, we just don't have. And so the, the, the science that we may bring to the table, coupled with this deep ecological wisdom of indigenous people is a powerful combination um, that's necessary for us to, to be successful. They're also really good at conservation. Um, this is a, a study from WRI, but there's many studies that show that land managed by indigenous people, local communities has lower deforestation rates than land managed by others, even a lot of times in government protected areas. And so here you can see, you know, we've talked a lot about Bolivia, we've talked about the Brazilian Amazon, other places, Guatemala and Mexico. There's other studies, not just this one, that show that deforestation rates in community managed forests are much lower than land managed by others. And so again, these communities have deep wisdom, they own a lot of land, they own the biodiversity, and they're really good at conserving it. So they're really key partners um, in this work. This is a map um, of those land holdings. It's, it's not complete, it's hard to get data about a lot of this, but you can see that a lot of the world's tropical areas are actually owned or managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, and we're gonna talk about a few of those places today and some stories that I'll have for you later. So the Nature Conservancy works closely when we're invited to partnership um, with Indigenous peoples and local communities. And we have a four pillared approach to our work. And these pillars are really based on, you know, Nobel Prize winning science by Eleanor Ostrom, by Amartya Sen, um, that shows how community-based natural resource management can be successful. And it's also based on our knowledge as the Nature Conservancy working for decades with communities around the world on conservation. So the first pillar for this is, is really securing those rights. So I mentioned that um, indigenous people in local communities have owned or managed 25% of the world's land, but a lot of times they don't have formal recognition of the light, those rights or legal recognition of the rights, or even when they do have legal recognition, um, those rights are not respected. And so the first step is really making sure that the communities have the rights to their land, their traditional territories, and are able to enforce and, and um, enact those rights. The second pillar is really about building leadership and capacity. And so, as I mentioned, there's a lot of deep wisdom, but we can also couple that with new technologies, new information um, to make sure that they are able to Im implement best management practices on forest conservation and habitat conservation. Additionally, we help um, build governance capacity, institutional capacity so that these community leaders are able to engage with other stakeholders and really negotiate for their future. And that gets to the third pillar, um, a lot of times decisions about um, indigenous people's lands are made with them not even at the table. So governments will make a decision, co corporate actors will make decisions, they won't even consult um, with the people who actually have been on that land for millennia. And so the Nature Conservancy does a lot of facilitation of uh, multi-stakeholder platforms, bringing government together, bringing corporate actors together, bringing the communities together so that they can have a dialogue and come to the decisions that can um, be more sustainable and just better thought through. And then the final pillar of our approach is about environmentally sustainable economic development opportunities. And so Stuart was just talking about the importance of livelihoods, of creating economic opportunities. And so it's really critical that for these communities to continue to stay on their land, continue to steward those resources, they need to thrive as well. They need to be able to have income opportunities. They need to be able to have market opportunities um, so that they can continue to stay on those lands and, and continue to protect them. And so we do um, community-led enterprises and market access and different uh, opportunities to help communities get um, income opportunities. 
And so looking at a couple examples of this, I'll take you over to uh, Borneo, East Kalimantan, Indonesia. We've been working there for a number of decades. Um, very important forest. Uh, it's a major carbon storehouse. It has you know, a lot of endangered species, including the orangutan you can see on the, in the picture, and it's a uh, very threatened rainforest area. So we've been working with communities for a, a long time. We created a, a process called CGAP. Um, in English, it means Communities Inspiring Actions for Change. And it really puts the communities in the driver's seat. There's seven steps where the communities get together and they take an asset-based approach. A lot of times when you think about communities, people are like, oh, they're vulnerable, they're threatened. But here we take a, an approach where they have a lot of assets. They have a lot of power, knowledge, um, and, and valuable resources. So they map out those assets and they themselves determine, you know, what is our vision for our future for our lands going forward and how are we going to get the resources we need to enact that vision. Um, and so it's a whole process of community mapping and planning that is linked to uh, government funding. Um, they've gotten the entire district of Barao, which is 2.2 million hectares to adopt this approach. So all 99 villages in the district of Barao in East Kalimantan are, to, are doing this process and we're expanding out throughout the rest of the province. We did a bit of a, um, a review of the results. 76% um, of the villages have stable or increasing village development indexes. 92% have stable or increased well-being, and 80% of these forests have reduced or avoided deforestation. So this shows that when you put those communities in the driver's seat, match it with government support and funding, um, you can get strong results in an area that is very threatened. And then we'll go back, we've been a lot in the Amazon on this call, but we'll go back briefly to the Amazon. Um, people have talked about the importance of this forest to the planet. Um, it's also incredibly threatened. It's important to highlight that indigenous territories cover 115 million hectares of the Amazon, um, which is 23%. And so those, those areas are really, really critical to stopping that deforestation that we've talked about. They are a strong barrier and they're important to avoiding that tipping point um, that several people mentioned on the phone call. Um, and so just one story to kind of wrap it up. Um, we work with um, 15 different communities, indigenous territories covering 4 million hectares across the Amazon. Um, and this really gets to our fourth pillar that I mentioned in our approach. Um, we were working with a lot of these communities to kind of map out their lands, map out their management plans, um, and make sure that they could, you know, continue to steward their resources. And the women kind of came to us and said, you know, we want a, a project too. We want to work on this as well. Um, and so the women had been in charge of collecting babasu nuts. Uh, it's a coconut, um, it's a type of coconut. And they um, got together and, and created a project to sustainably harvest these babasu nuts. And then we supported them to get the machinery and equipment necessary to process those babasu nuts into food oils or oils for um, beauty products. They created their own marketing uh, materials. You can see their logo that they came up with uh, down there below and we helped them access markets to sell these products. And so now the women um, have really shown their power and their strength to organize and help manage these resources as well. And they're bringing in valuable income into their communities to help those communities stay and thrive in place. Um, so what gives me hope on this World Rainforest Day is really folks like Kokote here in the picture who are strongly working every day, every day on the front lines to continue to protect their rainforests. And one of the most important things we can do is support their efforts. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you so much, Rainey. And I love that DREAM is part of your seven step process um, and that communities are able to really come up with their own solutions that they think are gonna work for them. Um, that's really, really wonderful. We're gonna um, finish this panel with Peter Houlihan from XPRIZE. And so I will pass it to you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you everybody for sharing too. This has been great. Let's see what else there is to say after all of that. All right. Oh. If I line this up, Andrew, do you have that video as well for the end? Um, Just want to make sure that's all set. Uh, thank you for asking and I will get it. <laughs> Thanks. I'll go ahead and start. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, my name is Peter Houlihan. I'm the technical lead for the Rainforest X Prize. And I'm going to get, with the time that we have, just closing this out, a little bit into that and um, share a little bit more about the background as to why the Rainforest X Prize. So as all of our panelists have explained today, 
the rainforest from the Amazon to the Congo Basin, Madagascar, and Borneo, I think we've touched on all of these locations today. And, and we're all pretty aware and familiar with the immense biodiversity that these ecosystems harbor and the benefit that rainforests serve to the planet. Um, and unfortunately, we're also just as aware of how these ecosystems are in decline today more than ever. Um, and especially as, as Tom mentioned in the beginning with this pandemic and several others, how many other aspects, including the pandemic right now, have um, really brought the degradation of rainforests and our planet to the forefront of our attention. Um, and, and for many people in rainforest conservation, documenting these habitats uh, is a pretty grueling process. And it can entail a, a lot of what I've specialized in for a while is leading teams of local scientists, local experts from all over the world to document biodiversity in these rainforests, to uh, catalog biodiversity, to inform policy in, in different countries across the tropics. And um, as you can see, and as many people are very familiar, um, this process often it requires many months, if not years or decades, in the field of, of careful documentation of this biodiversity. Um, and while that's all incredibly important, I think what we're facing uh, now and, and has become more apparent over the past couple decades is, you know, as with anything in life, this field itself faces two primary challenges, and that's certainly time and money. And I think, I think we're all aware of um, how if we had unlimited resources and unlimited time, you know, we might be able to be better equipped in, in documenting rainforests and coming up with uh, solutions. Well, that's not the case. And, and certainly um, we need to innovate and revolutionize the way that we are approaching certain aspects of collecting data and analyzing data to, to move forward uh, now. And so with that, um, XPRIZE, many of you may not be familiar, um, and I hope that you become familiar now because of this Rainforest XPRIZE. Uh, XPRIZE designs and operates multi-million dollar global prize competitions to push the limits of what's possible to solve the grand challenges of our time. Our mission is to inspire and empower problem solvers to positively impact our world. We believe solutions to the world's problems can come from anyone, anywhere. And this whole concept of prize-based competitions uh, originated with, and many people may not realize, with Charles Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic um, over 100 years ago, or almost 100 years ago. And um, since then, XPRIZE really was born out of this inspiration. And the first XPRIZE, the $10 million Ansari XPRIZE, was designed to lower the risk and cost of going to space by incentivizing the creation of reliable, reusable, privately financed manned spacecraft that finally made private space travel commercially viable today. Um, and Spaceship One, the winning technology pictured here, was purchased by Sir Richard Branson, um, which became what we now know as Virgin Galactic. And this Spaceship One uh, is now housed at Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum. Um, and so all of that is to say, you know, at XPRIZE we realized and, and really are working towards how can this be, this approach be applied to broader challenges in our world today. And that's where the Rainforest XPRIZE was born out of um, a $10 million competition that will last for five years to revolutionize the way that we approach the, the technologies and developing novel technologies to remotely and rapidly assess rainforest biodiversity and translate those data into insights that can be used for policy and conservation organizations and governments all over the world in real time. Um, and so this is all in early stages. Right now we're just in the beginning, but as I said, this is a five-year competition. And as we move forward, 
there will be multiple rounds of field-based testing from uh, qualifying submissions to semifinal testing to final testing several years out um, in different rainforests around the world. Um, and ultimately, several uh, prize awards will be split up uh, from the first place prize receiving five million, second place receiving two million, and a third pr place prize of half a million dollars with uh, many milestone prizes split amongst teams along the way. So um, one other important aspect that we're really passionate about is not just awarding the prize and it being over, but working with successful teams in the end in employing and deploying their solutions into rainforests around the world beyond the competition uh, and scaling that impact so that these technologies that are developed can actually be utilized in, in many understudied rainforests around the world. Um, and so with that, you can find a lot of information about the Rainforest X Prize on our website. We have, uh, that's rainforest.xprize.org. We have very comprehensive competition guidelines right now. And later in this year, we'll have even more comprehensive rules and regulations. Um, and most importantly, you can start a team. You can start a team, you can join a team, anybody uh, can be a part of a team. And that's essentially the phase that we're in right now of team recruitment is to get the message out about this. So please share this with um, people in our fields and, and other fields as well. The idea is to connect uh, tropical ecologists, engineers, software developers, and local NGOs and universities to all come together to form interdisciplinary approaches um, so that we can move this entire field forward. Um, so far we have teams interested from over 40 countries and, uh, and you, can, you can do that yourself. You can join a team, whatever uh, composition, we are open to it. So with that, I just wanted to really provide a quick uh, crash course on what this is. And actually tomorrow, leaping off of World Rainforest Day, our team at XPRIZE is going to be having an hour long informational webinar going way more into detail about all of the information you need to know at this time. Uh, you can find more information about that on our website at xprize.org as well as our rainforest.xprize.org website. Um, and definitely check out our gu guidelines there. And with that, I'll switch it over to Andrea to just show a quick promotional video about this. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, we're going to do a quick video from XPRIZE and then we're going to go into Q&A and I know that there's a number of questions. So that gives us a good about 15 minutes for questions um, to, the, to the panelists. Um, okay, let me, there we go. The rainforest, an area home to more species than anywhere else on Earth. I feel like I'm in the heart of everything. There's a thriving that is really powerful. An area that cleans our air, purifies our water, holds many of the important solutions to tomorrow's problems. This rainforest is instrumental to the survival of the entire human race. to protect what we have. The future of humanity is at stake. How can we monitor a large area of forests that would provide us with a view of the tropical forest functioning?
we need nature. Thank you, Peter, for your presentation and for that great video, which I feel like some so many of the different things that we talked about. Oops, let me get this off. Um, okay, I am going to pass it over to Kat. We've got a bunch of questions that have come in, both through Facebook and through our chat, um, and she's going to take it away. Okay, and I guess the best way to do this, just because we have quite a few panelists is maybe just send me a chat. Let me know if it's when you want to go ahead and answer. The first one I'll give you is from Facebook. How do we get the message through about the link between viruses and deforestation when there's such a high level of distrust in science right now? Does anyone want to take that one? If there are no volunteers, I, I have to call on someone. I'm thinking it should be Professor Lovejoy. Yeah, that is, that's a good one for, for Lovejoy. <laughs> yes, I'm <laughs> sorry. I would go second if, okay. if, Tom, you don't agree, but really it should be you. <laughs> You're the expert. Give it to me again. How do we get the message through about the link between viruses and deforestation when there is such a high level of distrust in science right now? Well, I don't think it does any good to just to assert that connection. Uh, that just reinforces people who have negative views about science, they won't listen. Um, I think you need to explain it. Uh, and, um, you know, with, with stories like the one that I was telling earlier at the beginning, right? <clears throat> um, and it just, you know, people have to understand that these pathogens are just part and parcel of nature. And it's, it's how we treat nature that affects the probability of their spilling over into human populations. So I think you just need to explain it in some detail uh, draw people into the story and hopefully that will get somewhere. Yanta, did you want to add to that? I'll just quickly add that it's, it's connecting the dots in very simple ways um, because there is there's such a lack of uh, basic knowledge right? And you can't give it all. It's, we've gotten to a place where attention spans are now down to three seconds. And so how do you start from one place and, and, and sort of connect the dots for folks uh, through storytelling or actually um, uh, illustrations, graphics? I mean, social media, uh, the younger generations, they've, they've grown up mm -hmm. online. What are the messages and how do they consume that information. I, I just, I was very clear yesterday to my young ones and I said, yeah, I have an opinion with what you're asking, but I'm going to be very clear. I'm 55 and my, my worldview is so different and I don't, the words that resonate with me, so different. And so how do we take technology, take ancestral knowledge? How do we take scientific knowledge? But then how do we create bite-sized pieces um, of information and, and take people on this journey of um, just enlightenment and awareness. So it's actually not, not something that just happens overnight, right? So a little longer answer, sorry. No, that's great. And I saw Stuart, you wanted to add something to that too. Go ahead. Well, actually, I was literally just going to say that it is, it is about ensuring that um, we tell the story of the evidence. It's about building the evidence and, and, and then being able to let people understand what, what that evidence is saying um, and tell it in a way that, in a language that people can relate to. And that's just as, as was mentioned about having different mediums to get that message out. 
Yeah, that's one of the benefits of social media for sure is having all these different channels. Uh, got one more from Facebook and then we'll take a few from the Zoom meeting. Um, might have to reword this one a bit. How can we help with rainforest conservation and help those that want to eradicate it for business and financial gains? So I think the question here is more, how do we work with people that are doing these activities, human activities that are detrimental to the rainforest? Yeah, Stuart, go ahead. Yeah, I think the, the really the crucial thing is to is to try to work with communities for, for, to understand and, and to help them ed, to be educated to understand the real benefits of forests, whether that be um, around their water systems or whether it's how they can find economic value uh, in the forest as well. And, and I highlighted a couple of examples when we were talking about things as well, whether it be from trying to find products from the, the forest that are done in a sustainable way. Um, it's, it's trying to find economic value and, and then un, and really almost educating everybody to really understand that the wider benefits of the forest, whether it be for, for well-being. Um, you know, I mentioned some aspects in, in my presentation as well. It's just there are an enormous benefit that probably even through um, this current crisis, many of us have recognized the real benefits of nature for us. So those benefits are uh, 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 something that's not always been apparent, but I think more and more people are starting to come to the fore about understanding it. But fundamentally, people have got to be able to put food on the table and support their families. So it's about economics and how do we drive the economic uh, routes that can really make things sustainable, communities to derive benefit from forests. I'd just like to jump in on that too, um, just to highlight that, you know, most large scale tropical deforestation is not driven by local communities, it's driven by agribusiness like palm oil, yeah. large scale cattle ranching, large government funded infrastructure projects like roads and hydropower. And so um, totally agree with Stuart that we have to empower local communities. Um, but if you really want to tackle the main drivers of deforestation, you know, look at your consumerism as your own as yourself. Who are you buying from? Where do those products come from? How are they created? Because a lot of the you know, large scale tropical deforestation is from you know, those large companies that are selling us products with palm oil in them, selling us products from unsustainable yeah. cattle ranching, selling us you know, products that are a result of mi illegal mining on indigenous lands, et cetera. And so I would invite all of you listening as consumers to you know, vote with your dollars and look into you know, how you might be perpetuating um, those cycles. I'd like to, to, to add to that, I think especially the, the stakeholders in, in the business, whether it's uh, we're talking about the rainforest, or we're talking about savanna systems, where, you, where your main stakeholder is that, that private business, uh, whether it's an acro business or whether it's a cattle ranching business, you should come with your ideas and, and present an economic viable uh, uh, situation for those stakeholders as well because they're interested about the dollars so if you can show a sustainable model that that helps uh, protecting the environment and has a, a, a beneficial economic incentive for for those stakeholders i think it's easier to change that that uh, towards a more sustainable uh, uh, business so all i i all I was going to quickly add was that, um, you know, it's really easy for any one of us to sort of think we're doing the work we're doing and uh, perhaps we can be, uh, we can distance, our, uh, distance our, uh, ourselves from uh, responsibility. But if you think about it, I often think about every one of us who has these darn phones or the laptops we're using, right? Where did that rare metal come from? Um, did it come from a, a Central African uh, rainforest? You know, our foods, we don't have the time always to check. And so it, each one of us, in this globally connected economy is connected to the drivers of deforestation, right? And so how do we all start seeing that and making those connections? And how do we inform the folks that want to do something? You know, most of the people on our planet today cannot take actions because they are so focused just on how to get their families fed and, and the shelter over their heads. But there's so many of us who can do something. So what is it that we're going to do? And how are we going to make sure that we learn and find out 
what these connections are, and then um, you know, educate and make folks aware. There hasn't been a better time for us to be able to do this, right? Social media and technology has completely changed our ability uh, to communicate. And we, you know, we have the technology and, and they're coming, evolving, and we're innovating at ways that we have never been able to, using blockchain, ability to use blockchain, being able to use social media, digital tools. And then we can ground it in ancestral um, knowledge and scientific knowledge. And, and there's so much we can do. And that's the whole idea for something like World Rainforest Day, right? That we collaborate as, as, as one, all of us that want to come together uh, to chart a different uh, different path. So, again, sorry, I keep I keep doing longer answers. <laughs> but oh no, that's fantastic. I I think we definitely appreciate your your full answers. I definitely think the audience needs to hear that. And let's just we've got a couple more minutes, so let's take one more. Um, let me scroll through and find a good one. Um, okay, how about this? We heard a lot about reforestation and restoration efforts through various projects featured from your talks. Can you share these, how these efforts can help us over the short and long term? Maybe Stuart, do you want to start us off? Yeah, so I think obviously the, the, the main aspect of trying to sh sort of share the stories is that we can inspire action, that we can sh uh, try to uh, almost, you know, build on the global movement that's uh, uh, sort of building around uh, more understanding of the natural environment and the protection that's required and the, and the restoration that's required because it really does start to have to, have to happen now at a much faster scale and at, at a much quicker pace. Um, and we really have to get those stories and messages out to so many more people. So the, the main message of having these sort of stories is to show that there is a real benefit to doing things and things are working on the ground. There are things that work. Yeah, and I think that's a message we want to try to get across is, you know, there's amazing work that's happening across the globe in many, many areas. We just have to get those stories out, tell people, and yeah. hope that, you know, and build on the global movement. Tom, did you want to add something to that? Well, just it's, it's exactly right. Success stories are the way to go uh, because they're tangible and they provide hope. And there happen to be lots and lots of them. Yeah, I think that <laughs> with that, I think we are actually right at time. Success stories is what Earth Optimism is all about. So definitely follow us on Facebook Twitter and Instagram. This session will be recorded. So if you were not able to watch the entire thing, uh, we will have it posted later today to share. I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us and celebrating World Rainforest Day. And with that, I'll say goodbye and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. All. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy thank you, everybody. everybody. Take care. Happy World Rainforest Day. Likewise. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you so much. And good luck with the rest of today.